Well, good morning. Praise the Lord. It's good to be with you this morning, although it's, as I said last week, it's a little bit different than what we're used to, but praise God. I remember last week after, and I mentioned this during one of the live videos this week, that um, I, I remember leaving here, uh, leaving church, the worship center, last Sunday, feeling just very grateful. Very grateful to God for, for his vision and everything that he had done to prepare us for this, for what was taking place. No one could have predicted that we would have gone through, that we were going to go through a season of being separated and that we would need to broadcast services. And I'm just so thankful to God that we, we uh, he gave us a vision that, that we were going to launch as Victory Church and in that, that we were going to uh, establish uh, the front door uh, the digital front door of this church, and we were going to set up uh, all the audio and, and the uh, tech upgrades and the cameras and everything that we were able to do to, to bring these services live to you. So uh, just so grateful for our, our, our tech team, our production team, our worship team, all our volunteers that are making this possible. We are, we are uh, abiding by the governance, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, we're abiding by all the guidance from government that we are uh, less than 10 people and we are keeping apart six feet as, as best as possible uh, so that we could honor uh, what the governing authorities are saying. We want to make sure that everybody's safe, but I just remember uh, leaving here being very grateful and even this morning, I'm here in the worship center, uh, the only one in the seats as the worship team is, is singing and praising and I'm worshiping God uh, like, like the house is full and I'm just so, so grateful. For, for his Holy Spirit, I'm thankful for the work that he's doing, and I'm thankful for everything that he has, uh, that he has planned and prepared for us. Uh, this morning, we're going to continue in our series, as, uh, as David said, we're going to continue in our series, Greater Than. Uh, last week, we spoke about worry. We spoke how, um, how uh, God is greater than worry. And, and we gave you, and we talked about how, how we can, uh, worry can, can, um, can begin to erode our confidence in our faith. And we actually talked about what are we going to feed in our lives. And I gave you an example of someone who, who um, a story that I heard the prior week saying that, the, you know, there was somebody that had approached this gentleman that had two, two large uh, muscular dogs. And he said, which one of these would, would uh, win in a, in a battle? And uh, immediately the owner of the dog said, well, that, that answer is easy. And the person asking the question uh, was a little taken back by his quick response. And he says, well, what, what do you mean? He said, well, it's easy because uh, the one I feed the most will be the one that will be victorious in a battle. And that's so true for us that whatever we feed the most will take precedence in our lives. If we feed worry, then worry is going to the, have the advantage in our lives and have the upper hand. But if we feed our faith, our faith is what will have the, the advantage and the upper hand in our lives. So, so we talked about worry this week. Um, we're going to be in Romans chapter 8, and I'm going to talk to you about suffering. Suffering. God is greater than our suffering. God has uh, a purpose and a plan for our lives. He has a purpose for our lives, and he has plans to get us there. And part of that is that we have to go through some suffering. But what I've been hearing a lot of this week is a lot of talk about, uh, not even this week, over the last, for a long time, I've been hearing uh, just people asking the question, like, like, why did God do this? Why is God doing this? Um, things like it's not fair and uh, this is challenging. And, and I understand the, the, what can seem like not being fair uh, and the confusion that could come from that. But I just want to, I just want to clarify a few things. In Genesis chapter three, we see the fall of humanity. God created everything perfect. God created. Um, uh, humanity, he created the heavens and the earth, and he created uh, everything perfect, and there was no sin in the world. But as a result of, of humanity's disobedience, we know Adam and Eve, they, they ate from, from, they did exactly what God told them not to do. They were deceived by the serpent, by Satan, and as a result of that, sin had entered this world. And at that moment, perfection uh, was broken. Perfection was broken, and then there was immediate separation between humanity and God because a perfect God cannot be in the presence of sin. A perfect God creates perfection, but when sin enters in, the perfect, perfection is broken, and then there's immediate separation from a perfect, loving God. But God in his grace had a plan of salvation, and we talk about that often, that even at that moment in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we see the first promise of a savior. God had a plan in place for and at the very moment where sin entered and separated humanity from God, God had a way out, and that was Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful for, for God's plan. But there is, a, there is a fall, and so as a result of the fall, evil has now entered through sin. Sin is what separates us from God, and in that there is evil. And evil in this world now, 
There are two different types of evil, and this is where the confusion comes in about what's taking place in our world with, with the coronavirus and this isolation and this uh, social distancing, everything that's, that's happening in, in uh, us having to quarantine ourselves. Uh, there's a natural evil, and, an, and then there, there's a moral evil. A natural evil is an evil that takes place in nature and is not attributed to any specific human sin after the original sin with Adam and Eve. I'll say that again. Natural evil is an evil that takes place in nature and is not attributed to any specific human sin after the sin of Adam and Eve. And then there's a moral evil, which is a demonstration of corrupted sinful humanity in the moral decisions and the actions we make as human moral agents. So we as, as human beings, we, we act as moral agents and there is moral evil in the world, which is the demonstration of that corrupted sin nature in our lives and in the lives of, of fallen humanity. So an example of natural evil would be a tornado. Or tornado, depending on which coast you live on, could be a hurricane. If you're in the Midwest, we, we, you know, there was just a tornado the other day in, uh, in I believe, in... Um, uh, not uh, south of here, there was a tornado. Um, the, so tornado uh, on the east coast, you see hurricanes, different types of things. That's an example of natural evil. Then there's a moral evil, which could be uh, looked at as crime. A kidnapping could be considered moral evil. Robbery, moral evil, and so forth. So there, there's two different, one is the actions of the, the, the moral agent, and one is just a result of the fallen humanity uh, in nature that has taken place from the fall of man. And you look at Genesis chapter 3, you can see how the ground was cursed, uh, the earth was cursed, creation was cursed as a result of the sinful behavior of Adam and Eve. When humanity rebelled, the earth was cursed in addition to uh, what had taken place with humanity. So natural evil is just what takes place in the natural occurrence. So there, there's been so much conversation that, that uh, even th some, some theologians, they'll say things like, like um, God... The, the coronavirus is part of God's creation, that it just hasn't been perfected yet. And, and that's just not a correct understanding of what the Bible says and even how to interpret what the Bible is saying, that in creation, God created everything perfect. There was no sickness. There was no disease. There was nothing that could create decay and death in humanity until sin entered in and severed what was perfect. So we can't look at, at the coronavirus and say that God created it or why is God doing this. Now, we say that God is in control and God is on the throne, but God has given humanity dominion over the earth. And that's another, another message for another time. So I, I, I don't want to talk about that too much, but because there is brokenness, in, brokenness of sin in this world, the curse of sin is still present. And as a result of that, there is, there is a, a, a moral evil that takes place in the lives of humanity, but there's also a natural evil that just takes place, the storms and everything that, that happens, as well as sickness and disease. So it's not as a result, we're not looking at coronavirus as a result of something that, that a decision that we made, unless, of course, there was like a biochemist out there, and I'm not saying that this is what happened, but if there was somebody that manufactured an agent that, that caused a sickness and disease, that would fall into the category of moral evil. But that's not the case here with what we're facing together as a world. And you know what's very interesting about this entire, the, the entire uh, uh, situation that we're going through? This is not isolated to a specific city, a specific town, a specific country. This is global. This is a global issue that we're going through together. It's a global pandemic, and we are all facing this together, all facing the same struggles together, all at different phases of when this, t t you know, the different stages of what's taking place. All of us are going through it together. So coronavirus, I believe, is part of the natural evil as a result of the fallen nature of humanity. This morning I want to talk to you out of Romans chapter 8. We're going to begin in verse 18 and go through 25. And for a few moments we're going to unpack these, these verses. We're going to unpack this scripture and we're going to see how God is greater than suffering. God is greater than our suffering. Romans chapter 8 beginning in verse 18. For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. 
For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes in what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. This morning I want to give you three keys, three action steps for us to to unpack this scripture and to be able to put it into action to recognize that God is greater than suffering. God is greater than what we are struggling with. And I'm not just talking about what we're facing right now, although it's very common that we are all sharing the same struggles or similar struggles because of what's happening in our world today. But we all, we can apply this to all of the suffering and all the struggles that we go through in our lives, every circumstance. So number, the number one action step is look beyond your present. We have to look past and look beyond our present situation and what we're going through. In verse 18, he says, this is, this is the anchor for the entire message here and even for this, this passage of Scripture. Uh, for I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to re- be revealed to us. So Paul, is, the Apostle Paul, uh, under, the, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is telling us, listen, you're, you're, going, you're going through suffering. And this is the Apostle Paul who, who's gone through unimaginable suffering, unimaginable pain and he's and he's pointing out to us that that this present suffering that you're going through you need to look past it you need to go past your current circumstance your current season and look beyond that and look toward what God has prepared for you the future glory is so great that our present sufferings are insignificant by comparison when we look to what God has prepared for us Heaven, eternity, when we start looking past our present suffering, they're talking about the perfection of the glory of God, how we will attain that perfection when we see Jesus face to face, that we will, we will be glorified, talking about the resurrection of our bodies. We're talking about salvation we have in Jesus Christ, that when we see Jesus face to face, that we will share in God's glory, and the glory that he has prepared for us far outweighs, makes the present suffering that we're going through, our present struggles, and the seasons that we go through, insignificant by comparison. And not only our suffering, but I can tell you that even in our, in our celebrations, even in our, in our mountaintop experiences and our valley experiences and everything in between, those present situations pale in comparison to the glory that God has prepared for us. It's so important that we look ahead to the future, that we look, that we look beyond our present circumstance and our present situation. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse 17. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient but the things that are unseen are eternal. Isn't it something how the Apostle Paul, again, in 2nd in, in first in Second Corinthians, is telling us that that the things that we're going through now, the things that we're experiencing in this earth, they're they're transient, they're passing through, they're temporary, they're not here for eternity. But the things that are unseen, the things that God has prepared for us, are eternal. That the, the glory that God has prepared for us is far outweighs the temporary things that we're going through. There's a a Latin phrase that many of you have heard before. It's called carpe diem, which means seize the day. It's a a very popular thing that, that we always... That we always reference, that it's often talked about, that that it's it's we need to carpe diem, seize the day. In other words, make the most of today with very little regard or no regard to the future. It's interesting as as you think about that phrase and you think about think about humanity that. Carpe diem, the heart behind that is to not waste opportunities. But as humanity, we can find ourselves stuck in that. We can get stuck in the the present moment, in this moment right now, when we are in the middle of our suffering, that we can't look past it and and we stop going 
uh, looking beyond our, our current circumstance or our current situation. There are seasons in our lives, and we as human beings, that we understand and we go through different seasons. There's a beginning to every season, and there is an end to every season. Every season will end. Every season has a beginning, and every season has a middle, and every season has an end. There are, there are periods of time where we go through uh, times of celebration, and then there's times of weeping, and there's times of struggle. There's times of challenges. There's times of, of ascent. There's times when we're, we're pursuing goals, and th these are all seasons, and we can find ourselves when we're in the more challenging seasons in our lives that we find ourselves stuck there, where if we look at carpe diem, and we look at that whole Latin phrase and that understanding, we can, we can be stuck in our present moment, not looking beyond what's taking place. Last week, we talked about worry. And it's interesting. Worry has us stuck in our tomorrows. When we are worrying, we're always worried about what's next, what's coming tomorrow. And we start to, we start to worry and obsess about, about the very next thing. And Jesus talked about that. We, we saw in Matthew chapter 6 last week that, that uh, worry will cause us to, to, to be stuck in, in looking to tomorrow in, in terms of provision, in terms of what's going to happen tomorrow. Whereas suffering has us stuck in today. It's, the, it's very opposite. See, this is how, this is how uh, um, Satan works in our lives or Satan works against us. He tries to, to un unravel or flip around what God has, has made perfect. That's the brokenness of sin when it comes into our lives. Worry makes us, makes us, uh, causes us to be stuck in tomorrows, concerned about what's going to happen next. Um, and suffering keeps us stuck in today, that we're never going to get out of this. Or we start to believe the lie that, that God God uh, is bringing some afflictions in our lives. Now, there, there are times where, where God does allow, actually, God does allow things to take place in our lives, but in that suffering, it produces growth in our lives. In that suffering, uh, he teaches us to look beyond our present circumstance and our situation. But we also talked last week that there are, that there are consequences to our choices, that we make choices. Now, there are good consequences, and then there are negative consequences, things that uh, every choice we make has a, has a consequence, whether it be something that would advance us or to grow us or that would, it would be positive. Or there are negative consequences, decisions that we make that cause us pain or causes us aggravation or causes us frustration. So every decision we make has a consequence, and we have to stop putting blame on God for decisions that we make. Now, Coronavirus isn't something that, that is not a consequence as a result of decision that any of us individually have made. But how we treat our current circumstance, well, that's on us. I spoke to you about that uh, f several weeks ago when we talked about the blood of Jesus. That, that, um, that when, we, when we make decisions, that when, when the government gives us guidance and they say self-quarantine and they tell you that you, you need to do this and you need to do that and you need to, you know, they give us this guidance and they give us wisdom on how to prevent the spread of the virus. Well, then that, that's on us. If we, if we choose not to obey that and we wonder why we get sick, we wonder why. Uh, it's it's kind of like I think I gave the example somebody with, with um, uh, that, that has a... Um, that needs angioplasty, that they, they, the doctor says, listen, your, your, your arteries are getting clogged. You need to cut back on, on this, these kind of foods or that kind of foods. And we disregard it. And we say, no, no, it's okay. I can do whatever I want. And then we wonder why we're at risk for a heart attack. We are responsible for our actions. The Bible tells us in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, first the natural, then the spirit. We do what we can in our ability with the sense, with the wisdom, with everything that God has given us. And then when we run out of ourselves, then the spirit of God takes over supernaturally for us. First the natural, then the spirit. That was the order in 1 Corinthians. With First there was Adam, and then there was a second Adam, which was Jesus Christ. First the natural, then the supernatural, then the spirit of God uh, stepping in on our behalf. So it's very important that as we look at this, as, we, as we're in the middle of, of COVID-19 and coronavirus, everything that's taking place, that we do our part. We do our part. Do you think I like having to see you only online? No, I miss seeing you face to face. But my concern is that we submit to the governing authorities and that we do what the Bible tells us to do and that all of us are safe and all of our families are safe. And when this season is over, we will be back together. In fact, my prayer is, and it's, it's my heart, and I've been seeking the Lord about this, that at the end of this, we will all see the immense value of us coming together and not forsaking the gathering of the saints, not forsaking coming together and having church in person. I'm thankful for online capabilities. I'm thankful for technology. I'm thankful for this. It's a blessing. But what I'm more thankful for 
is the opportunity for us to come together and worship God together in person. This is, this is, this is a blessing. So anyway, um, we need to look beyond our, your present. Look beyond your present situation. We have to find ourselves in a place where we're not allowing ourselves to get stuck. Now, these are, these are real struggles that we're having as a result of, of the quarantine, as a result of, of, of the social distancing. We're finding ourselves in places of isolation where God didn't create us to be isolated from one another. That's why it's so important that we connect online, we connect through Facebook, that we're messaging each other, we're Facebooking each other, we're, d- we're doing everything we can, pick up the phone, talk to people. Crazy idea, right? Uh, from digital age, and we're going to technology that to hear someone's voice, we need to make pick up the phone, stay in contact with each other. Um, you can find ourselves in places of the isolation would cause depression, would cause uh, uh, fear to, to slip in to, from a result of worry. That's why we're talking in this series, greater than. God is greater than our worry. God is greater than our suffering. We're suffering right now. We're struggling right now. We're going through different things together. We're all going through it together. But we have to look beyond our present. Number two is anticipate forever. Anticipate forever. In verses 19 through 23, and I'm not going to read those verses to you again. In those verses, you're looking at creation. Uh, it's, it's the analogy that, that, that God is making through the Apostle Paul. This, this analogy at creation uh, behaving like humanity. Creation is anticipating when death and decay are removed. It's the imagery of that they're groaning as in childbirth. That, that the, the creation, the creative order, they're going through the same suffering as a result of the curse of sin that entered this world. The, planet Earth, the creation, everything was made in perfection. But because of sin entering in and causing the separation from God, creation itself is suffering. Just like humanity. And the analogy is bringing is bringing us to a place of, of looking at creation and saying that's, that's where we are as humanity. That the suffering, that we're not going through the suffering alone. We're not going through, we don't go through our struggles alone. Our struggles may look different than struggles of other people, of, of each other, of our, of our uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. That we, our struggles may look different, but the suffering that we go through is comparable that we're all, we all go through suffering. We all go through seasons of suffering and different challenges in our lives. But in that, we have to anticipate forever. Creation was anticipating when, when Jesus would come back and make, and make all the death and decay go away. All the, 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 the natural evil that we talked about earlier, they're longing, the creation is longing for it to, to go away, for God to come and make it right again. And how much more should we, as followers of Jesus Christ, those of us who the, who the scripture says here uh, in this text that, that we who have the first fruits, what does that mean? We who have the evidence of eternal hope that's anchored in Jesus Christ by the evidence of the Holy Spirit living within us, how much more should we anticipate forever? Talk about eternity, and I've said this to you before, that I th- in eternity, I th- we, our human brains can't fully comprehend Eternity. Eternity is not a place in time. Eternity is, is outside of time. Time is in God. God is beyond time. God created time. Eternity is outside of time. Eternity is found only in God. That we, when we look to eternity and we try to, try to wrap our brains about, around it, of course, we look at it in terms of forever. Forever and ever and ever and ever. Forever is, a, is, is time. Is, is a period of time. It's, it's, it's an endless period of time. Eternity is outside of that. And the more we, we kind of dwell on that, it, it, would cause, it causes my analytical brain to explode a little bit because we can't fully comprehend outside of eternity. That's why we look to, and we put it in terms that we can relate to, we have to anticipate forever. We have to anticipate past our current circumstance and we have to anticipate that there is a forever. There is a, a heaven. There is... Uh, in God's plan, and with eschatology, you could look that, that uh, a new heavens and a new earth that will be created. Where there will be a messianic rule, on, uh, Jesus Christ himself will rule in a new earth. And we're a part of that. And the Holy Spirit within us bears witness to the fact that we are part of that eternity. We are part of that forever. 
1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. Jesus said that I go and I'm going to prepare a place for you. That there's plenty of room in, our, in my father's house and I'm making room for you. Jesus is talking about eternity. He's talking about heaven. He's talking about the new heavens and the new earth. He's talking about forever and ever and ever. And we need to anticipate that there is a forever. That this life, as we, as we talked about before, as we look beyond our present, as we're looking beyond our present, we're anticipating forever with our Savior and our God. Eternal separation, and this is, this is the most egregious thing of, of the curse or the brokenness of sin, that separation from God. That if we don't make the choice of surrendering our lives to Jesus Christ, and it is our choice, receiving that free gift of salvation, that our forever and ever apart from Jesus, is complete separation from God. The Bible talks about a place called hell, an eternal place of, of torment, of being separated from God. Our problem with what we talked about before in Carpe Diem is that we never, and we never look beyond our present. We never look beyond where we are. But when we look beyond our present, when we look beyond our current situation, we have to anticipate forever, and then we have to answer the question, what are we going to do about Jesus? People that I meet for the first time, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting, people that don't know me, although now living here in the Midwest, particularly where we are, it's a small town, and apparently everybody gets to know everybody very quickly here, um, but prior to being here, meeting, I would meet new people all the time in a larger population. And it, the conversation would always come about where I'd say, what, what do you do for a living? And we'd talk about that for a while. And then they'd say, what do you do? And i tell them, well, I'm a pastor. And immediately it goes, oh, oh that's, that's interesting. Oh, and they get very uncomfortable or, or it's kind of different. Because what happens is once the conversation goes in that direction, sooner or later we're going to get to the question of Jesus. Because once we're, we're presented with the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have to answer that question, what do we do about Jesus? Now that we know, because Jesus brings eternity into our present. And he says, I'm giving you the keys to eternal life. You have to come through me. What are you going to do with that? We have to anticipate eternity. Eternity. When we give our lives to Jesus, no matter what we're facing, what we're going through, as we look beyond our present, we can anticipate forever. We can anticipate that we, what we, no eye has seen, the scripture says, nor ear heard, nor our heart can imagine the wonders, the beauty, the, the, the glory that God has prepared for us, the perfection that God had prepared for us, death, decay, gone, all of earth groaning in Romans chapter 8. Look, it's saying, it's saying that creation itself will be set free from this bondage. Think about it. What a, what a, what a, um, a use of, of vocabulary where we look at the original language and it, 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 it points out that, that creation itself is in shackles. It's in bondage as a result of nothing that creation did. It said that they were subjected to this futility not by their choice but because of what, what humanity has done and because of this separation. They had no choice in the matter. It's an analogy looking to the fact that we, if creation is, gonna, is going to anticipate forever, how much more should we? as followers of Jesus Christ, anticipate forever. Anticipate what God has prepared for us. We can treat it flippantly and we can, we can find ourselves in, in the season of struggle and we can, we can often set up shop there, meaning that we can put our camp in, in this place of struggle and we could live there and make our struggles, our suffering, our identity. God didn't, uh, doesn't want us to identify with the suffering as who we are. He doesn't want us to identify that, that make that our identity. Our identity is tied to Jesus Christ. Our, when we give our lives to Christ and we apply the blood of Jesus to our lives, our identity is secured in him. That is who we are. And we are who he says we are, not by our circumstance or our suffering that is happening to us or that we're in the middle of. No matter if it's, if it's as a result of decisions that we've made, 
as a result like this coronavirus of no decision that we made whatsoever. It's something that is happening to us. It doesn't matter. We don't identify with our suffering. We don't, we don't identify with it in terms of uh, 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 making that our identity. Our identity is tied to Jesus Christ. And that's why we talk about victory. Because Jesus overcame the grave. Jesus overcame sin. Jesus overcame, and he said, because of me, when you embrace what I've given to you freely, you yourself will walk in that same victory. That's when we anticipate forever. That's when we anticipate uh, what God has prepared for us, the glory that is to be found, that we, are, we will be released from the shackles of this fallen world. Finally, the third action step is to remain hopeful. Remain hopeful, verses 24 and 25. For in this hope we were saved. Everything that we've talked about up to this point. For in this hope, what? The, the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, that, that the Holy Spirit uh, it, it, uh, um, cries out from within us, that there, is, that there is a hope for us, that we are saved by the blood of Jesus. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes in what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Who hopes for what you cannot see, for what you, for what you see? Think about the chair you're sitting on right now. I don't think you're sitting on that chair hoping that it will hold you up, that it will keep you. It's something that you know it, because you see it, you touch it, you're sitting on it, you know it's holding you up and sitting on it. But what if the chair wasn't there and you just, it's hoping that the chair will be there. Or if you're, you're looking, it's dark and you know where the sofa is, you know where the, the seat is and, and you, you, you kind of have an idea where it is and you believe that it hasn't been moved and it's dark and you go to sit down, you hope that it's there so you don't fall on the ground. There's a difference there. When you see something, it's how, and you can touch it and you can feel it and you know it's there that because you can see it and you can use all your five senses, that's not hope at all. But when, you, but when there's something inside of you that cries out to an eternal God and the spirit of God inside of you is bearing witness to that and saying that there is a God, there is hope, and that hope is tied to Jesus Christ, that we can remain hopeful. Psalm chapter 71, verse 5 says, For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. God is our hope. God is our strength. And our hope is, is tied to Jesus Christ. Our hope is anchored in Jesus Christ. There, there's so much waffling and hope in, in so many different areas of our lives because we, we find ourselves stuck in looking at what we can feel, what we can touch. But when we, when we stay anchored to Jesus, and I know I've been talking to you about this a lot, and I will continue to do that, that especially in these times of where we're geographically separated, that we remain anchored, we remain connected to Jesus Christ. Because the moment we detach from Jesus, that's when hopelessness starts to come in. But as we stay connected to Jesus, as we, as we remain tied to Jesus, as we fix our eyes on Jesus, our hope is secured in him. It goes back to what we spoke about last week. What are we feeding the most? Are we going to feed uh, our present suffering and, and dwelling on that and, and just focusing on that and, and living in that present suffering? Or are we going to focus and give our attention to Jesus Christ, who is our hope? Are we going to feed our faith and, and give our hope the, in Jesus the predominant feeling in our lives? Our hope should be anchored to Jesus. Our hope must be anchored to Jesus Christ. I think of, I, I mentioned it earlier this week in, our, in one of our live videos, and I talked about the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 16. Actually, Paul and Silas. They were, they were, um, they had just, they were preaching the gospel. Many were coming to Christ. And they had just, um, Paul had just uh, um, removed a demon, cast a demon out of a young girl. And that demon was uh, someone who was telling the future, was, was, was telling the future of everyone that they came in contact with. So it was a slave girl, and the slave girl was, the owners were very angry because uh, as a result of that deliverance, that through Paul, that 
he, he lost a source of income. And as a result of that loss of income, they got very upset. They beat them, they stripped them, and they threw them into prison. And you want to know what happened? The Bible says at the midnight hour, they were praying and singing hymns. They were praising God in awful circumstances. Do some research on a Roman prison on this in, ancient, in the ancient world. Look, take a look at what the ancient world looked like, uh, what a Roman prison looked like at that time. It was, it was awful accommodations, uh, feces in, in there, uh, rats and all kinds of rodents, uh, just, just awfulness. They were in shackles. Terrible, terrible circumstance. Terrible suffering that they had gone through. For what? For preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. For delivering a young woman from a demon. They were beaten. They can sit in that situation and they could have said, this isn't fair. What did we do to deserve this? This isn't fair. God, why are you doing this to me? This isn't fair. I don't understand. We were doing what you've called us to do. And yet, here we are, suffering for no good reason whatsoever. I think we can find ourselves in, in much less dire circumstances. But we would say those very things. But we don't see Paul and Silas doing that, do we? Go read Acts chapter 16. We don't see Paul and Silas complaining. We don't see them saying, God, why me? God, why would you let this happen? God, this, God, that. No. Instead, at the midnight hour, when they were exhausted, when they should have been completely depleted of energy, at the end of one day, at the end of one season, and at the beginning of the next season, in that transition period, they were choosing to bring praises to God. I wonder how many of us do that in the middle of our suffering. I'm challenged by that, church. I'm challenged by that very statement. Because I think, especially for us, in American society, we've known blessing, we've known provision, like most of the world has not. And when we find ourselves in places of suffering or struggle, and not even for the gospel's sake, just circumstances that make challenges in our, create challenges in our lives, how often do we choose to complain to God instead of choosing to praise through that? to pray through it and to sing. You want to know what happened in Acts chapter 16 at that midnight hour? God came in and enthroned in their praises. God came in in the middle of their prayer and in the middle of their singing and he, the place shook and the shackles came off of them. And as a result of that, the jailer, his entire family were saved. The Bible doesn't say it, but probably some of the other prisoners as well. When we choose to praise, when we choose to remain anchored in the hope of Jesus Christ, and that's what it was for Paul and Silas. They, were, they remained hopeful in the middle of their suffering. They remained hopeful in the middle of adversity. They were anchored to Jesus Christ. So that gave them the supernatural ability, by the help of the Holy Spirit, to praise God at the midnight hour, in the middle of pain. They were probably uh, just unbelievable circumstances. We won't talk anymore about that, but just unbelievable circumstances because they were anchored in the hope of Jesus Christ. They were remaining hopeful, and that's the challenge for us. All of this that we know, we have the benefit of all of Scripture, all of the apostles and the prophets that came before us, and we see the faithfulness of God. We see the mighty hand of God. We see everything that God has done on our behalf and everything that he's prepared for us. How much more should we remain hopeful? How much more should we remain hopeful to know that God has, uh, has our eternity secure, that through Jesus Christ our hope is anchored in him? I'm very challenged this morning by this. We can find ourselves stuck, stuck in our suffering, stuck in our pain, and I'm not diminishing the things that we go through. We go through, we go through struggles. We, there's so many times I find myself in a place where I'm saying, God, why? And immediately the Holy Spirit checks my heart and he says, you don't have to know the why. Just trust me and praise through it. Praise through it. My suffering may look different than your suffering, but it's real. 
I know it's real. I know you're struggling. I know that there are challenges in your life. I know that there's sickness. I know there's disease. I know there's financial hardships. I know there's relational struggles or brokenness. Those are real things that, that crush us. But in the middle of all that, we don't have to be stuck in it. We can remain hopeful if we are anchored to Jesus Christ. So this morning, three action steps that will help us to walk, walk through our suffering and to know that God is greater than our suffering is number one, look beyond your present. Look beyond what you're going through right now. It may be your, su your suffering right now may be as a direct result of COVID-19. Everything that's happening with coronavirus, that, that, that may be your suffering. That may very well be the isolation, financial hardships. That may be what it is. Or maybe, maybe you're not really suffering from this. You're enjoying the, the rest. Or maybe you're, you're really making the most of it with family time and, and really focusing on your family unit and, and, and God is, is blessing you with that. Maybe it's something else. Or maybe there's, there's something that, that happened to you that you're just struggling getting past that, that, that place of suffering where you're stuck in what happened to you. You're not, you're not identified. Your, your identity is not tied to what happened to you or even what you've done. Look past your present. Look past your state of suffering. Look beyond it. Second action step was anticipate forever. There is an eternity that God has prepared for us that's anchored in, in our in Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sins that comes as a result of being a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. We have to anticipate that there is a forever, that he has prepared eternity for us, a, a something uh, that's outside of time that is probably beyond our complete and full understanding. But we can look at it and saying forever and ever and ever and ever. I've often said that that I don't believe in the equivalence of time in eternity, let's say we say 100 million years from now, that we're going to look back as we are enjoying the presence of God, fully glorified, in perfection, that we're going to look back and say, boy, that little bit of time that I spent in time on earth, I wish I would have spent more time on me. really wish I would have devoted myself more to me. No. It will be a, a fleeting thought to say that I wish I would have spent more time focusing on eternity, focusing, anticipating forever, knowing that there were people that are lost and dying around me, that I need to anticipate that there is a forever and that there are people that don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Finally, the last action step is to remain hopeful. The only way we can remain hopeful only way we can remain hopeful is if we're anchored in Jesus Christ, is if we remain connected to Jesus because our hope is tied to Jesus, nothing else, nothing else. And the way we remain connected to Jesus is by being in his word, by getting into the Bible and talking to him in prayer. We don't have to overcomplicate that. It's just talking to him like you would talk to another human being. You're talking to God. He wants relationship with you. But we cannot remain hopeful by our sheer will. We cannot remain hopeful by our... by pulling ourselves up by the bootstraps. The only way we can remain hopeful is if we remain anchored to Jesus Christ. This morning, I'm going to ask you, wherever you are, wherever you're watching from, whether it be live or on a recorded stream that you're watching this. Maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Or maybe at one point in your life, you did, and you just, you know, the saying is, it never really took. You never pursued him in relationship, and you're, you're not living for him now. The Bible says that every single one of us has sinned. We've talked about sin. We've talked about the fall of man in Genesis chapter 3. Every single one of us, sin separates us from God. None of us are perfect. And none of us can earn forgiveness and access to forever. 
on our own. But God, as I mentioned earlier in this message, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, he had a plan. He had the promise of a Savior that he himself stepped out of eternity and stepped into time that he created. And he gave himself up for us. Jesus gave his life so that we could have forgiveness of sins. If you're listening to me and you have not made that decision to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, or maybe you did at one point and you're not living for him now and you want to rededicate your life, I want to lead you in a prayer. A prayer that I will help you with the words but the Bible says if you believe in your heart, basically what, what's coming out of your mouth, let your words line up with what you believe, then it'll be yours. The Bible says everyone who confesses with their mouth and believes in their heart that Jesus is who he says he was and that God raised him from the dead, that you will be saved. Pray with me. and Make these words your own if you want to give your life to Jesus. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. I recognize that I'm a sinner and I can't save myself. I realize now that the only way out for me is Jesus. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. Help me to live for you. I know that it won't be perfect but I know you're perfect. Draw me close to you. Help me to pursue you, come after you every day. And make yourself real in my life. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for setting me free. Amen. If you made that decision this morning, either for the first time or maybe it was the hundredth time, and that's okay. I want to put something in your hands. I want to send you something. It'll be coronavirus free. It's just a little, a little booklet that talks about the decision that you made today. Would you please either comment in, in the uh, Facebook live stream or send us a direct message on Facebook or you can email me, prayer at victorychurchmo.com. Just give me your name. Say that you made a decision for Jesus this morning and I want to get something in the mail to you prayer at victorychurchmo.com. For everyone else, the challenge this morning is, is to allow the Holy Spirit to let this word pierce our hearts so that we can truly get a spiritual, mental, under, a spiritual and mental understanding that God is greater than our suffering and that these light and momentary challenges, these light and momentary struggles that we go through is producing in us something that will last forever. I want to pray over all of us. As we are in this challenging season together, though we're separated physically, spiritually, digitally, we're connected more than we ever have been. Father, come to you in the name of Jesus and we're thankful for your word this morning. Holy Spirit, we're thankful for the fact that you're making this word pierce our hearts, causing us to respond to you. Father, this morning collectively, we all ask you to forgive us for allowing our suffering to be the predominant thing that we feed in our life and not our relationship with you. For making suffering our God by, by giving it so much attention. Lord, we're not minimizing the challenges that we're going through. In fact, you said that in this life, we're going to face trouble. We're going to face persecution. We're going to face trouble. We're going to face all kinds of challenges. But you said to take heart because you, Jesus, have overcome the world. Lord, that gives us courage. That gives us faith. It gives us peace supernaturally. So, Father, we ask you to forgive us for those times where we put our suffering or our season of suffering above you. And we ask you to help us. Help us, Lord, to, to look beyond our present. Help us, Lord, to, to look beyond our current circumstance, our current situation, our current present situation of suffering and look past that. Help us to anticipate forever. Oh, Lord, you've prepared, 
You've prepared a place for us that is beyond our hearing, our seeing, our understanding, our ability to conceive. Lord, you've prepared an eternity for us that is beyond our understanding. Help us to anticipate the perfection, the glory that you have prepared for us. And finally, Lord, we pray that you would help us to remain hopeful. And Father, we acknowledge this morning that our hope has to be anchored in Jesus Christ. If we are not connected to Jesus, we will not be able to remain hopeful. Help us to be like Paul and Silas in the most unbelievable and perceivably unfair circumstances. They were able to praise regardless. Lord, let that be us, that we will remain hopeful and in our hope as we're anchored to Jesus, that we will praise through our suffering. We will praise through our challenges. Father, we ask that this wouldn't be just a word for right now, but this would be a word that would feed us every day, that we know in our heart of hearts in our, in our, and we cognitively understand as well by the power of the Holy Spirit that you are greater than our suffering. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, church, I want to want to speak a blessing over you. As the Lord kind of spoke to me last week, especially in this situation, that we should close out our services by me just declaring what God spoke to Moses to declare over the people, a blessing. I want you to know that I love you. I'm praying for you. I miss seeing your face. Please use the prayer line, prayer at victorychurchmo.com if you need prayer, and stay connected to one another. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. I love you, church.